But thank you for joining us. So we started this class by calling it the stupid and the silly, but what we actually kind of want to say is um, what we're doing is we want to tell you about some of the unique and different things that we've learned and played with along the way. So we're going to show you a little bit of like a whole assortment of things that we've done. And some of them we're just going to talk through and tell you about a little bit what we did in Notch. And then some of them, uh, especially towards the end and the first one, we're going to show you a little bit of Josh actually showing you how we built some of these things. So again, I tell people we're probably still doing this wrong, but this is how we do things and we want to share those things with you. And the other thing is we're really just here to share our experiences and the kind of fun things we get to do with Notch. So uh, let's jump into this with a video. This little fun project is the furball that Josh made. And uh, Josh has kind of gotten a habit of making some kind of daily videos and just seeing what we could do in Notch. And one of those things was creating fur. And you kind of saw a thing on the Facebook group that said, man, I wish I could create fur. And then Josh went, let's see what we can do. And so I wanted him to explain a little bit about how he created fur and Notch, which I think is a thing you don't see a lot of times uh, as people making fur simulations. So just kind of a fun project. but. How about it? Yeah, I, I kind of have a good, bad habit of anytime someone says, oh, man, Matt, you should make this possible a notch. I'm like, I, maybe that might be possible already. So fur was one of those things. Um, but it really became possible with, whoop, messing things up, really became possible with this node right here, taper deformer. Um, it takes your geometry and it lets you taper it. So I basically just uh, got a, a plane, made the poly count as low as you possibly could, and I said plane, a, a 3D shape made as, po uh, as uh, low poly as possible, tapered it, and then uh, cloned it, that's the shape, cloned it around a sphere. Right. And uh, by the way, I'm going to share this project file on the Facebook group later, because uh, some people were asking about it. Um, it also has some audio activity and things like that, and some rendering techniques that might be useful. But yeah, so basically, it's just this one shape that one shape right there that then gets copied over the entire, um, the entire sphere. And then I spent, you know, two hours or so just tweaking lighting and tweaking the material settings on it until it started to get kind of realistic looking, which I was happy where it ended up. And, um, yeah, there it is, furball. Pretty simple, but I, I think the, the results were interesting. <laughs> So one of the next kind of side projects was uh, glass. And this was actually something Josh did quite a while ago in kind of the same vein of saying, how do you create glass textures? Well, now that is possible. But I wanted to bring this thing up because there's an interesting point when we talk a lot about optimization when you're doing things in real time. Part of doing things is faking it to make it. And one of the interesting things about this is how Josh created glass was actually in a way that he kind of faked it and gave the appearance of glass, but it wasn't glass or glass things at all. You want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, so I'm not going to show the project file on this one, but um, yeah, basically b before I think the last big release of Notch, um, doing transparency and reflections at the same time was impossible. But what happens if a client says, hey, I really need glass, so you got to figure out a way to make them happy. Um, so in that case, I, I did a, uh, a separate off-screen render using the render to texture node of a sphere. Um, and then rendered out just the metallic of that sphere. And then in another scene, I rendered out a ball with transparency, no metallic on it at all, and then simply just composited that metallic pass on top of a semi-transparent ball. Use the film grinning to do a little bit of RGB aberration on it as well to give it a little bit more of a thickness look to it. But it's, um, it's just an example of like, just because it's in real time, just because it shouldn't be possible, is probably still possible too. You just kind of have to fake it. So one of the, f the f I say one of the first, but the second project, and we just wanted to show this of kind of a very different vein of things in Notch was this was Josh's. This was your second project, second project. you ever did in Notch, um, as we kind of call the ant. So it was really. I mean, you can really explain more, but it was really this idea of just kind of showing what's possible in doing something very different than traditional motion design. And Josh also has a background in visual effects. 
which I should say. Yeah, so with this one, I, I spent two weeks on this because I was learning how, this is how I learned to use Notch. Set up my house for two weeks, hoping that I'd get a project. Did it for two weeks, you know, obviously. And um, and this was also another another time, you know, they were, glass wasn't possible, but I really, I saw this photo of an ant and a dew drop. I was like, oh, I want to make something like that. Um, and I'd also recommend that, like, use photo reference as you're building things because it kind of helps you to, to have an A, B to base your quality off of. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's, um, I just like pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and then ended up um, making the scene. But this is really to more show a progression of what came next. So we're kind of digressing a little bit with this piece is, I kind of said silly and stupid, is some of the things that were kind of silly to us actually I became projects later because of playing. And one of those things was we were on a demo uh, in Las Vegas playing with some technology and we got the chance to play with black tracks. If some of you don't know, black tracks is for position tracking objects in space. And so what we actually did was we, we taped a tracker to our iPhone camera and ran this notch scene and now you can dynamically look around the scene and we were like, huh, that's kind of a fun thing and we kind of just played with that and thought that was cool. Well then, uh, a couple months later, this is pushing almost a solid year and a half ago, uh, we had coffee with these guys in Atlanta that said, um, hey, we do film production, blah, blah, we had coffee, it was cool. And literally at the end of the conversation, they go, oh, I forgot to tell you, we own a robot. And I said, hold on. So they, these guys are based in Atlanta and they do film production. They own this robot called a Mark Roberts Bolt. It is a very, very fast robot. It can travel about 15 feet per second. That's about five meters a second. Very, very fast. Um, it weighs about as much as a car, but we basically just started playing around with saying, how could you integrate a robot into Notch? And basically put this camera on the end of this thing. And what it allowed us to do was create virtual worlds that we could look into. And this was just kind of a fun thing. And so what we actually did is we shot kind of a piece where we did a, this kind of, as you've kind of heard, augmented reality is becoming a thing. We projected on a backdrop and said, we can actually create virtual scenery that you're able to look into by moving a camera around. So now that we had this robot, we could shoot these scenes and look into this world that never existed. Uh, one of the key things about this is because it was real time, this was such an experimental thing, we could just sit there and play. We could sit there and Josh could make changes to figure out what things looked better and better. But jumping to that point is it actually led to us working on a music video. And I'm really excited because we actually just wrapped this in December. And with the exception of those top two frames, everything else you're seeing is completely captured in camera using Notch. So we basically set up an LED wall and built these scenes in Notch, and then we shot them on set. Give me a little bit of idea of some of this. Showing some of the talent moving on set and kind of what this looks like. And we actually did use a system and we camera, did camera tracking to actually perspective match some of the scenes so you can actually see what it looks like on set, but then this is off the camera assist monitor because I don't even have the finals, what this actually translates to. But one of the points I wanted to make about what we learned in this is um, real-time graphics do have limitations, and so what we actually looked with in this piece was rather than saying let's create photorealistic worlds, we actually said, Let's create things that don't look real. And this scene was actually based off of like the Tesseract from the movie Interstellar. Is we basically just said, let's build things that actually don't, that aren't real and build those in Notch. And so we only share that piece to kind of just show you some of the things that are impossible possible in Notch, but how we just started playing and ended up in some other projects. So from that, I'm going to take a hard right turn <laughs> into a scoreboard. And this was something really unintended we did with Notch which is we got to work for the brand Gatorade for South by Southwest. And Gatorade had this, these brand activations where attendees could come in and play games. And what we actually built was a scoreboard system in Notch. So we also at Meptic built a very simple web backend that just used, uh, it was a system that these people could put in scores so they could test how high you jumped and they could put in how high you jumped and then it would appear on the scoreboard all rendering in Notch. So what we did is we just used RSS, um, like RSS news feeds, to take the values from the website and publish those to Notch because it was just it was easy and quick and what we knew and we knew it would work. And then boom, we were able to build a real-time scoreboard. 
So brainwaves, this is a fun thing. So Josh has always wanted to get into brainwaves and reading brainwaves around the company. And so last year, we just started playing with it. And what we actually tried to This really leads on to, and Josh probably elaborate a little bit, is um, a lot of doing things in Notch, even auto reactivity, is visualizing data when you look at its core. It's about how do you take something that is meaningless, a number, a value, a thing, and make it into something beautiful and meaningful to an experience, to people, to something. And that's a lot of kind of what we do. And the brainwaves are kind of a key piece of that. It's like you would just get all this data and then try to correlate that data into something. You can even see on his laptop all that spreadsheet is just graphing values to see how could we make this into something cool. Um, but Josh, you can say like the workflow is pretty simple. The headset has... Yeah, I mean, at first it sounded kind of daunting, like taking brainwaves and making real-time visuals with it, but really it's, it's quite simple. There's a few um, just commercial EEG headsets you can buy, Emotive, Muse, um, things like that. Um, they typically all can spit out OSC commands, and then you can take those OSC commands into Notch and create visuals based on what you're thinking. So um, it's, it's a little difficult to just to give to someone and go, okay, what your, your brainwaves are going to generate these graphics, you know, because it, it takes a while to kind of like look at it and, oh, wow, when I'm, when I'm chilling out, it, it all turns blue. And when I, when, you know, someone walks up behind me, it, it turned red and, you know, flared up. Um, and things like that. But after a while, you start seeing a correlation. It's a really cool personal experience. This isn't actually a project we've used for a client yet, but I, and I don't even really kind of know how we might, but it's something that was a, a, it was a real fun month of having that thing strapped to my head and experimenting, you know, with different things we can do with it. So leading to two things we're actually going to show you a bit of behind the scenes are uh, one of our clients in a project we worked on. One of our biggest clients that we get to have a lot of fun with is a company called Drunk Elephant Skincare. They're one of the largest skincare companies in the United States. And they literally found us on Instagram a couple of years ago. And this is one of these clients where they came to us with an idea and we said, well, what if we could do something else and make that interactive? And that's actually snowballed into a string of events and we've done a ton for them. But the first one we did uh, was this event in Las Vegas where we basically made three LED walls that were originally just supposed to be pre-rendered content, but we actually took that and rebuilt all of their imagery and then added Notch by using three Microsoft One, version one connects, as you can see, and just building some really fun experiences because this world is not used to technology. Skincare is very traditional uh, trade show booth design. So this was like kind of a whole different thing and it was just taking something they already knew and saying, what if? But with this project, this, as I said, led to other projects, which was part two. So we had always wanted to play with something called LiDAR. And LiDAR is a little thing what they're built for. They're little tiny boxes, and they're built for industrial automation. They are these uh, invisible laser scanners, and they're meant so when an employee sticks their hand into an assembly line, the machine shuts off. That is kind of what they originally intended for. And They've been used before in Interactive. We weren't the first people, but we always wanted an excuse to play with one. So we brought one into the office, and you can see that little orange dot sitting on top of the LED wall. And this is Jordan, our motion designer, pictured here on the team. And we started playing with it. It was just one of those things that we didn't really have a use case for it. But then we, again, took it to Drunk Elephant, our client, and we came up with this project, um, which Josh is going to show you a little bit of, but we built another version of their trade show booth that has a one millimeter LED wall that we then made touch interactive. But even further, if you look at the pictures um, on the sides, the shelves actually have pixel tape. And we actually used a program most of you might be familiar with just called MadMapper. And we actually fed Notch via an NDI network stream into MadMapper. And we can actually convert video content into pixels in the shelves. So jumping into that, uh, this is what some of the interactions looked like. And this is one of my favorite ones that uh, kind of came to be is, Jordan on our team created the flowers in Cinema 4D, and then Josh brought those into Notch. But we also created scenes like this, which Josh is going to show you a little bit of, in which the whole wall could be touch sensitive. But a really neat thing is you can see the letters are actually extruded acrylic, so they actually sit out. But Josh actually matched up, and you're going to see the letters so that the fluids actually flow around the letters. Um, and then this is another one where you can see 
Um, but you can see the bottles flip over. And then when you actually touch the letters, they actually light up. Mm. So why don't you show us some of that, Josh? Yeah, so um, I'm actually just realizing now that this scene, I, I got rid of the hot zones, but there's a, there's a node in Notch called hot zones where you could say, when something enters the zone, give a zero to one, make the value go to one. So you could use it to trigger lots of things based on space and, um, and whatnot. But basically, this, this scene is extremely simple. Um, it's, it's just a, a field um, with a line at the top that's admitting fields. And then it, it goes down. I'm, I'm using um, an image effector to make the, the fields go around the, the acid trip logo. Um, on site, I got each individual letter and lined them up perfectly and then saved save that out as a screenshot and bring it back into Notch so I can all line it up on site. Um, but yeah, it's, it's quite simple really, just, um, just admitting fields from the top. Um, and then they, they come down and then once they hit this point, that point is where the LiDAR comes in. It's, and so we, we used some data conversion to get the information into Notch so that you could have up to 10 points, people touching at the same time, and then convert the X, Y from LiDAR information into um, it's a notch, as you can see, whenever you move the, uh, the value around, it updates, it kind of vortexes and pulls it in. Um, we have, uh, I brought the flowers one in instead. You can see on the, the left side, that's the, the content that's actually getting mapped to the, uh, the pixel tape in the shelves. So you really only see the flowers on the, on the LED wall. But in, th in this case, you can see how kind of, this one's much more complicated. Um, each one of those on the right side of the root node over here, those are the individual flowers. You can see this one's kind of struggling on my laptop. We have better machines at the office to run this stuff. Um, and then over here are all the different, the individual user points that get brought in via LiDAR, data conversion, come into Notch, uh, so that whenever you touch any of the flowers, as I think in the video you saw, we can speed up the animation. That's the same exact technique as that we talked about in the last talk, where you take in an FBX and then you can change how fast it, the playback is based on hot zones. Hot zones are really great if you haven't played with them for interactivity purposes. So jumping ahead to the last one as we're running out of time is the Genie. So same client, like I said, we get to have a lot of fun with them. They actually came to us and we, we designed and fabricated a Genie bottle. This was their trade show booth for their show. Uh, I have to tell you a quick side story. It took uh, about 10 people, about four weeks to fabricate the structure. It took up about an entire semi-truck to ship. Uh, it took four days to assemble on site, but the best part is the entire show only lasts four hours. Um, about, probably about five hours after this picture was taken, it, the entire booth was sent to a recycling center. <laughs> True story. Uh, but we had this idea is that the client wanted a genie bottle. If you've ever seen the show, I Dream of Genie, it is based off of that. The pillows are actually handmade from like recreations of the show. But one of the touches which Notch brings in was Josh had this idea to build an interactive genie. So this genie is built in Notch and running in Notch. And not only that, he does facial tracking. So as you can see, when Josh walks up to him, he actually recognizes your face and gets happier and engages you a little bit. Um, but the genie also, we did some audio and some, uh, excuse me, like voice, voice speaking. Acting. So this was a really fun one because it was such a different thing for us to do with Notch was to actually say, could we build a character? And Josh was just like, hey, I have this idea that we could build this genie and let you show some of that. So yeah, it was like the hardest thing ever to, to build this. Um, so it's a, a character that I built in Maya, textured it, all that, and um, did a facial rig, and then imported that FBX into Maya. Um, once the FBX, FBX was in, in Maya, I took every single joint individually and positioned them manually into that pose, which I'll show you. Um, and then his breathing is just a sine wave in his chest. You can see that I use sound modifiers in his mouth, so as I'm talking, his mouth moves. Now, it doesn't quite work so well with my voice, but when the sound was coming in internally through the computer, um, through the voice actor, I matched it up so sounds that were like, oh, would be more bassy, and they would respond to deeper frequencies, and like higher pitch sounds like E would, um, would make him kind of make it more of an E shape in his mouth, which on site worked quite well. You can see he's just kind of following the audio that's coming through my microphone on the computer. But um, 
Yeah, it's kind of, uh, this is all the, the meshes, but then down here are all the joints. These are his hands. This is his face. Um, this is his chest. Um, and so we, I have, uh, it's, this is, like I said, probably the most complicated thing I've ever built, notch, but um, it took quite some time. But there's, um, there's things that say, like, with the face recognition node, you can say, is a face detected? If so, zero to one, yes. If it's yes, then it switches his face over from being kind of whatever to he perks up and his eyebrows raise up. And those are all joints that are in this FBX character. And I say, range remap from this position to this position. The joints in his face, range remap from this position to this position. Um, yeah, quite complicated. Again, in his chest, he just, in his, like this, is just a sine wave back and forth. He blinks also just with a math modifier that's piped in to a gradient modifier. So it's, you can do full procedural animation with no keyframes whatsoever in, in Notch. So yeah, that's everything we have on this. And again, we have any questions? No, there are no keyframes used in this batch. No keyframes at all. Everything's with math. <laughs> What's the difficult thing about changing from uh, loop to uh, input from a camera? Is it cross-fake, I think? Is it calculate when, how slowly cross-fake, I think? For the, for when you need to text faces? Yeah, you said it was a lot, a lot of work to make the interaction. Right, yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the trouble with interactive design is I act one way and every one of you acts a different way. And so when I interact with something that I create, I know how it's going to... I know how it's going to react to me. So, you know, I act a certain way. Then Nick comes along and he does something like, whoa, whoa, what are you doing? I didn't expect you to move like that. So I have to adjust, adjust, adjust. So it takes quite a, a bit of time. You have, to, you have to test out anything interactive with multiple people to really see, is it going to work? Because otherwise you get on site and no one's going to act the way you act. Um, but in this case, um, again, I use the facial tracking node just with a webcam that was mounted to the top of the Genie uh, bottle that was kind of pointed down at about, you know, average height size. And in, in that node, you can use an extractor modifier coming out of the face tracker that says uh, face present or face detected or something like that. And that just gives you a zero or a one. And from the zero to one, you can take that into what I did was a, it's called a smooth envelope modifier, which then slowly phases it up. And those go into a series of range remap modifiers to then go, what should it be whenever he's not seeing someone and what should it be when he is seeing someone? Um, and he turns his head based on um, where someone's face is in the webcam raster. And that's because you can use extractors from the face modifier to get XY information. And XY information then gets put as a target null to his, to his face. So his face always faces the null, which is the person who's looking at him. Um, we did actually, we, we had an outside program that was doing speech recognition as well. So you could say like, hello or hey, and then he would respond and, and say pre-recorded things back to you like, How's it going? Nice shirt, nice shoes, and mm -hmm. give you compliments and things like that. So it's lots and lots and lots of layers. Well, I think we're out of time. Yeah, last question, if you're quick. Last question, I saw a hand quick. Can you talk a little bit more about the hot zone? That note for... Uh, about and hot also zone. The, the LiDAR talks to it, you said it's yeah, we can, since we're out of time, we can talk about it. You can come find us after. Yeah, it's, we'll it's chat. kind of complicated. <laughs> All right, uh, give uh, them both a big hand, okay?